Hello and welcome. I'm James Petty with the Supernatural Bible Study. This is session two, and this is Jesus the model. All right, so Jesus on the first point models relationship. Okay, so it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, and to see him is to see the Father. Uh, Jesus being the second Adam is the model for the Father's intended expression of how mankind should relate to him and relate to the world. Okay, so John 14, 9 through 11 says this, Jesus said to him, have, you been with, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own, uh, on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. All right. So Jesus models a healthy, vibrant, and vital relationship with the Father. Jesus is the expression and the demonstration of union. He says that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. All right. So the Father, Father God, He's not some far off forest. He's not distant or aloof. He's not, uh, you know, He hasn't wound the clock off and clock up and walked off. In fact, uh, He is with us. He's with Jesus. All right. And Jesus has this experience of the Father being with Him and being in Him. And it says the Father that was inside of Him, the Father who dwelt with Him, did the work. All right, so John 17, 20 through 23. I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through, the, through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the, wor the world may be believe ah, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, Jesus in this amazing chapter, John 17, which you absolutely must read, uh, he's saying Jesus invites us into the same vibrant relationship that he has with the Father. Jesus prays that every believer would experience the union and the nearness that he abides in. Uh, now, many people would really do well by stop believing that the Holy Spirit um, is somehow far away or stop asking for the Holy Spirit to come or that he's somehow distant. He's not. Uh, you should just ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to the union that you share with the Father, to the union that you share with Jesus. You have been invited in Christ into union and fellowship. Actually, a lot of people, that whether they realize it or not, you are walking in union uh, spiritually, but you may not know it in your mind. You may not experience it in your emotions. You may not experience it in your body. But spiritually, being reconciled, you are in union with the Father, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus longs for unity in the body of Christ. But I'm telling you, that cannot be accomplished unless we have really discovered our union on a personal level that we have with God. If, we're out of dis if we are experiencing disharmony with God, it's going to be very hard to walk in harmony with mankind and with our brothers and people that are, uh, that are different from us. All right? so, but the more we walk in that revelation of union, that Jesus dwells in us, that the Holy Spirit is present with us, the more we experience the union and harmony we have with God, the easier it is to have that, that same understanding that we are have union with our fellows, brothers and sisters who may be very different from us. Okay. Ephesians 2.13 says this, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I love that verse, that I have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. You know, it's not, it's not by my own self-effort. It's not by my good works. It's not by anything that I bring to the table that, that it brings me into this union, except that He gave me a measure of faith, and He made me aware that He wanted relationship with me. And in faith, I took that little, that little measure that was given, and I expressed it towards Him and asked Jesus to come into my life. And by that, that simple turning to Him, that blood of Christ that was shed for all mankind has brought me near to God. And uh, I mean, if, you know, I really want to emphasize that a lot of people just keep coming up with excuses of why they can't be near to God or why God wouldn't want to show up for them or why, why, why they can't have as much of God as, the, as, as he's made available. Really, if Jesus died 
to bring you close. If Jesus died, that you would know him. It's it's of utmost importance to him that you know him. And when I you know when I think about like the parable of the son, you know the what is it? The son that is um <laughs> the prodigal son. Thank you. I've got the prodigal son, right? He he's coming back from his journey. He's rehearsing all these things in his mind like, "Oh, I'm going to tell my my dad I'm a slave and and I'll just work off my debt and you know and in the father says, you know, he just turned around and he came running to him. God's not looking for your perfection. He's looking for your heart that's turned towards him. And he's looking for you to simply turn around and look at him. And that blood of Christ is like a magnet going to draw you close to him. Uh, secondly, Jesus models morality. Okay, so don't don't lose me here. I'm, I'm not here to bash you on your behavior. I'm here to show you how Jesus demonstrates right relationship with God, and the expression of that right relationship is correct behavior. Okay, so Jesus, by nature, being sinless and in harmony with the Father, expressed the uprightness and the righteousness of God's character. Now, he didn't he didn't do it on his own ability. He didn't uh, work out his righteousness on his own strength and by gritting his teeth. No, it says, like it says in John 14, 10, the Father lives in Jesus and does the work. Okay, that Jesus depended on the Father in that harmonious relationship for the Father's nature to be expressed in and through him. Uh, the Perhaps the primary misstep that followers of Jesus make is they, they believe that resisting temptation, doing the right thing, uh, originates in them, or it's somehow like they have to grit their teeth and just get it done. When, when the Bible says the striving we need to do is simply to strive to enter His rest, strive to enter the knowledge of His nearness. And I'm telling you, as you draw near to Him, your behavior modifies. Because when you're around something holy and beautiful, holiness and beauty is expressed through you. And the less the temptation has a grip on your on your mind and your heart, the less you you know have behavior that is ungodly. And that's really the process of sanctification, is drawing near to Him and letting God express His nature through you. The gospel and the, and the relationship with God is supernatural through and through. All right, so like your ability to overcome vices, things that, that you've struggled with. Think of anything you struggled with that now you're different because you met Jesus and he changed that in your life. That is no less supernatural than praying for the sick and seeing the deaf hear. Okay, like your ability to overcome uh, everything that plagues other people in mankind who don't have Jesus is supernatural. You know, like when we didn't know Jesus, we had a nature, a sin nature that was so easy to sin. It was like I was a, a sin machine. I had no trouble sinning when I didn't know Jesus. It was easy. I, I could do it all day long. Now in Christ, sinning and, and doing things that are wrong, it doesn't come like first nature to me. It's harder to do. I feel conviction. I don't want to do those things because Christ's nature dwells in me. And even if you're like, you struggle with something, but just that simple thought that says, man, I don't want to do this is evidence that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you and convicting you unto your own righteousness. Okay. Uh, I love Jeremiah 31, 31. Through 34. That's a lot of 30s. But it says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall a man say to his neighbor, Know the Lord, uh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I'll remember no more. So God has made himself known in Jesus, and now the Holy Spirit dwells in you and this beautiful new covenant. His nature and his person and God's morality is written on your hearts and put into your mind. All right? The outflow of union with God is righteousness and right behavior. Uh, and so the new covenant is an invitation to yield to the Holy Spirit and let that Torah be written on your heart and express who God is. Uh, Galatians 5.22 through 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, we've all heard sermons on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and everyone always jokes about, God, you know, if you're going to pray for patience, don't pray for patience. And I just like to have us set that aside for a minute, because it's not about 
the fruit. You know that fruit just grows naturally? Fruit on a vine, it's not like a grape is like, man, I really got to grow this fruit and put a lot of effort into it. Fruit is the natural result of being rightly related to the vine. Okay, And in the same way that the fruit of patience, the fruit of love, the fruit of long-suffering, all those things are the fruit of being connected to the vine. All right, Those things will happen by nature because God dwells in you. Um, but So I would say this, that if you're like one of those people like, you're going to, I need to pray for patience, I wouldn't pray for more patience. I would pray for a deeper encounter with the Holy Spirit. I would pray for a deeper understanding of who He is. I'd ask to have my eyes open to understand the beauty of Jesus and behold Him. And it's through beholding and fixing our mind on heavenly things that we're transformed and those heavenly things are expressed in our lives. So, uh, the, set, the third point is that Jesus models ministry. Okay, And I hope I don't hit too many hot buttons here, but this is actually really basic stuff. And I do want to just give a foundation of ministry. I love ministry. I'll tell you that it is a blast. I can't tell you how exciting it's been in my life to see the blind see and have the deaf hear and see, you know, people with paralyzed injuries to the arm or strokes be healed or open sores dry up or tumors disappear. Like, I can't tell you, when I walk away from meetings and that stuff happens, I'm like on cloud nine. It is awesome. It is so exciting. Uh, at the same time, if all we see and all we go after are like the miracles and these things that excite us, we don't want to make that the emphasis, okay? When we want to emphasize ministry in the way that Jesus did it. And so I just want to look at that for a minute, that Jesus modeled ministry out of the place of relationship. And to see Jesus minister was to see the result of an intimate relationship with the Father put on display for the whole world to see. And that when we minister, our goal is to be intimate with Jesus, intimate with the Holy Spirit, and in our sonship and our knowledge of who He is and who He's made us to be, express that. And the expression of that relationship is healing, signs and wonders, the demonstration and signs of the gospel. Uh, And so Jesus' ministry was a demonstration of the Father loving the Son and that love transforming lives and circumstances. Uh, Matthew 3, 16 through 17 says this, When he had baptized, Jesus came out of the, uh, immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the, fruit, uh, saw the fruit of the Spirit. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I'd like you to think about that for a minute. This, Jesus, before he has done a miracle, before he has done anything truly remarkable in front of people, The Father comes and says to him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And and that is where we want our ministry life to begin. We want it to begin that before anything has ever happened, before God answered one prayer or one person was converted, that even if we never bore like the amazing fruit in our minds and we're some superstar in ministry, that we start with a place that God is well pleased with us. He delights in us. He, he, he loves what Christ has done in us, and he's excited for that, and that we are well-pleasing. I just want to release that. You are well-pleasing to God, just as you are. Before you've done anything incredible, and you're at, not having your identity be in your ministry, but having it be in that relationship with God, that he's pleased with you. Uh, and so, in Jesus' ministry, the nearness of the Father was cons- consistently on his mind. And so rather than look at se- circumstances, he looked to the Father for his direction and instruction. And I'd like, I'd like to think we should do the same thing. It says, John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. So it's important that we bring the same expectation of union with the Holy Spirit into any situation we're called to minister in, okay? So we don't just want to go into ministry like you wouldn't want, here, this would be a a wrong approach to ministry. You get, you fast and pray before you're going to preach, okay? And you're like, you're fasting and praying, God, do amazing stuff and help my preaching be good and help me heal some sick people. And then, and then you just go out and you preach and you do the stuff, uh, but in the, that moment of doing it, you're not connecting with him. You know, you don't want to have a disconnected ministry life where like you're praying and you're intimate with the Lord, but when you go to minister, you're disconnected from the Holy Spirit. You're not listening. You want to bring that intimate relationship, that, that crying out into your ministry life. You know, a simple question to ask God before you begin to pray and minister for people is to say things like, Holy Spirit, what is on your mind? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? 
I love those questions. Those open-ended probe questions of the Holy Spirit can really open up a whole world of, of seeing and hearing of what he wants to do. Holy Spirit, what's on your mind? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? You know, John 16, 13 says this. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. So in the same way that Jesus perceived the Father and what he was doing, uh, we can inquire of the Holy Spirit, and he will share with us what he hears. Isn't that amazing to think the Holy Spirit is listening to the Father? He's got open ears to what the Father's saying, and so he's actually listening on your behalf. And then he's going to tell you, or literally because the Holy Spirit is prophetic, going to tell you things that are going to happen. And so bringing that understanding and expectation into your ministry life really is going to open up your expectation of what God is going to do. He's going to speak to you when you're ministering. He's going to tell you what's going to happen as you minister, or what's going to happen in the future as you minister. Uh, and then to do all these things with boldness, to just, when we hear and when we see what the Holy Spirit is doing, react with boldness and in, in full confidence that our relationship uh, is secure with Jesus, which secure with the Father, that if he said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So we're going to be acting in boldness, opening our mouth to speak and to share. Now, I just want to close with this. Now, as a young Christian, I was really hungry for the Holy Spirit, hungry for the power of God, hungry to see miracles. And one day I was praying and I was like, Holy Spirit, you know, what's the secret? You know, it was like a mystery to me. Like, what's the special sauce that I need, you know, to really operate in signs and wonders? And I actually heard the Holy Spirit say, I'll tell you the secret. Now, man, I can't tell you how excited I was because, like, I'm going to get the secret knowledge, you know, of, like, how to do this stuff. And I, and I actually, like, got I stood up. I put my hands. I was like, Holy Spirit, this is like a holy moment. What's the secret? Like, what is it? And he says this, listen and obey. And I was like, wait, that's it? I was like, I was kind of disappointed, to be honest. I was like, that's too easy. Like, it, it can't be that easy. And I do, I just want to tell you that it is as easy as listening, having a listening heart, and what you hear in relationship doing those things. And that's what unlocks the supernatural power of God in your life. And if I've ever worked any any sign or wonder or seen God do anything, it's because I simply wanted to hear, have a hearing heart and I was willing to do what he said to do. And so I just want to bless you with that. Thank you so much for being at this Bible study session too. And uh, just learning about how to minister, how to be, and how to walk in righteousness out of relationship because that's what God intends for us. God bless you. I want to talk to you guys about how Jesus is our model, but also how Jesus being the model changes my life, changes your life. I absolutely love what James points out. The fact that this model that Jesus gives us is a model of union. It's a model of how to live life according to the faithfulness of the Father. He stepped into life in that union and invited us to do the same invited us to bear the same fruit that he bore because what he did was made a relationship, the relationship he had with the Father, available to us. One of my favorite verses, favorite portions of Scripture that highlights this is actually Judges chapter 6. When we look at Gideon, Gideon's a man who is in the midst of a world of chaos. And the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, this is what the Father has decided to do. The Father has decided it is time to bring heaven to earth, to bring something of his heart alive through his people on earth. Now Gideon, in this moment, honestly, is a pretty good example of me a lot of the times. He was completely focused, completely captivated on the experience of the world around him. And that captivation, his attention on his world, led him to just a heart of complaint. And so it's this moment where what's in his heart gets put on display to the angel. But then the angel says, this is what the Father will do. And Gideon comes to this moment of honesty saying, I love what you're saying, but I'm not enough. I can't do this. And if it were me, I would have responded with, oh, you are enough. It's great. I love what you do. I love how you do it. I saw what you did with your neighbor that other day. I mean, it was, it was powerful. It was good stuff. You're enough. You got this. It's not at all what he says. Gideon comes to this honest moment saying, I'm not enough. And the Lord responds and says, I know, but we're going to do it together. And Jesus is this model of we're going to do it together. 
When you look at his temptation, when you look at the opportunities, when you look at the moments when he reveals what it is he knew to be true, he decided, I am son, so I will not do it without my father. I will do nothing that my father is not doing. And even when he passed on this calling, this, this lifestyle, this normal to his disciples, he said, I have shared with you everything I heard the father saying. And even in the moment when he got honest, when he got face to face with the father and was able to say, I was faithful. It actually wasn't he was faithful to teach or to heal or to cast out the demons. He said, I was faithful to tell them what I heard from you. Jesus was one who knew how to hear. He knew how to listen. He knew how to receive. So what do we do with Jesus being our model? We learn how to receive. We learn how to listen. We learn how to hear. We learn to not speak until we've heard. We learn to not react until we've received his perspective. So let's do this right now. Face to face with him. Find him in the room. The presence of God is always with us. We're just not always aware of it. Put your attention on him in the room. I want you to just ask him, what do you feel about me? Take whatever time you need. If you need to hit pause and just take a second, what do you feel about me? Maybe he'll share a word. Maybe a scripture, maybe a song will come to mind. Maybe it actually won't be your logical mind. Maybe you'll just feel an emotion. Receive it. Feel it. Be present with it. Jesus knew how to be present with what God was revealing, however the Father decided to reveal it. And then next, what do you believe about me? What do you believe is true according to what you've accomplished? And the true essence of being a believer is believing what he says, believing his perspective over our own, believing what he accomplished over what we've accomplished or haven't. And when we step into that identity as one that knows how to hear, receive, and we choose to believe his perspective, we begin to live out of something that's greater than our own. So let's be believers together. Let's be as Jesus modeled, The ones who listen to Him. The ones who know how to receive Him. The ones that choose to believe Him.